You're listening to the Doc Lounge Podcast. This is a place for candid conversations with healthcare industry's top physicians, executives, and thought leaders. This podcast is made possible by Pacific Companies, your trusted advisor in physician recruitment. I am your host, Summer Gilbert, and I am the Director of Marketing and Branding here at Pacific Companies. And my co-host for this episode is our EVP of training, Chris Call. Thank you for having me, Summer. My pleasure, Chris. Well, today, Chris and I got to talk to Dr. Kamala Tamarisa, board-certified cardiologist specializing in electrophysiology. So not only is she a female in a male-dominated specialty, she's also in a leadership role. She was one of the first cardiologists in her region to implant the world's smallest pacemakers. She's incredibly innovative. She has amazing advice. So I can't wait for you guys to listen to this episode. So hang on really quick after this brief message for our conversation with Dr. Tamarisa. And just a quick reminder, this podcast is intended to be an open forum. Any personal beliefs, views, or opinions represented in this episode are that of our guest and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Pacific Companies. So please have an open mind and remember that this podcast is not a news source, but rather a safe and neutral platform for candid conversations. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Tamarisa. We feel so fortunate um, to have you here on the Doc Lounge podcast. My pleasure. So take us back. What inspired you to want to go into medicine? Medicine was always a dream since I was a young child. I would say maybe in middle school um, when they start teaching you science, uh, when you start to dissect the earthworms and uh, frogs. And, you know, I always was fascinated with the heart. Um, it's, a, it's just a dream. And I am the first one in the family to walk the path of medicine. Everyone else is a PhD or an engineer. So I had no guidance. Um, and so for me, I would say it was just a dream. And I was very passionate about just the heart and the way the heart pumped, the function. So it started quite early for me. So it sounds like you knew right away that you wanted to study the heart. Yes. I um, knew when I was in high school, actually, I started to look into cardiology, and uh, I did think of cardiac uh, you know, surgery, cardiothoracic surgery, um, because I do love doing procedures. I love taking care of patients and uh, do procedures. So a combination I was I knew was a perfect fit for me. So I debated between cardiothoracic surgery and cardiology. In cardiology, by first year medical school or even second year, I know it's going to be, if I went into cardiology, it will be cardiac EP, electrophysiology. Yeah. And the cardiac were... EP is, um, you, you, you already know, cardiac EP is a very fascinating field, and it's a new field has been pretty much, um, you know, people know about electrical system of the heart, I would say about 40 years. Um, You know, really the procedures took off in the last 20 to 30 years. Um, Before Mm -hmm. that, people did not know much about the electrical system of the heart. Right. Uh, And and I'd say over, over my experience, I've talked to a lot of cardiac surgeons, cardiologists, interventionalists, EPs, uh, and I kind of call that the high end of medicine. I mean, it's kind of the, the pinnacle what type of characteristics should someone have to go into EP? Someone who, obviously, you know, um, medicine, uh, let me take a step back if I may. Uh, you know, for someone to go into medicine, you need to know that, you know, ultimately it's a patient. You know, you need to have the empathy. You need to know how to care, how to communicate, how to be an effective and uh, a wonderful physician. Along with that, for someone to go into EP, I would say you need to have a skill set where you can see something which is abstract. If you look at interventional cardiology, everything is visible. You know, it's like the plumber's job. You know, mm-hmm. inject the dye, you, you can visualize. EP is very abstract. So everything we do in the lab is electrical signals. And so to understand the abstract size, uh, side of the medicine with the compassion, Along with it, someone needs to have a lot of patience and uh, because the procedures can be very long. These procedures can be very short or can be very long, and you do need a lot of patience. 
And the last thing I would say is a precision, you know, ability to hold the catheter in place, ability to multitask. When I talk to the medical school residents or, you know, pre-med students or even residents and fellows who are looking into EP, I tell them this is one field where you have to know how to multitask, pretty much use all your senses. I'll give you an example. So when you stand in the lab, you know, you're pushing on the floral pedal, you know, the radiology, the x-ray picture, and Mm -hmm. then your hand is moving the catheter or the lead. Then you have to navigate the care with the staff in the room, the anesthesiologist. Not only that, with the mapping systems now, you need to be able to use the, you know, um, impedance-based or um, volume-based mapping systems. So then you're communicating with the mapping people out there. So it really tests your multitasking um, and uh, skills. At the same time, you have to be very focused. There's no room for error because these patients have ejection fraction of 15%, 10%. You know, those who come to the lab for by the ICDs, you know, defibrillators, they're a very sick group of patients, and so there's not much room for error. So those are the skills someone should and need to have. So I was just thinking of the multitasking and other professions that do that, and the thing that popped into my mind was like a drummer. They got multiple beats going on, they have to sing, they have to kind of slow down and speed up with the rest of the band. I mean, otherwise the music doesn't come out right. hmm mm-hmm. And uh, that's a beautiful analogy because I, you know, if you think about it, the heart has a beat. And I usually mm-hmm. tell patients, it's that efficient drummer, you know. But even the most best drummer in the world is going to skip a beat here and there. Yeah. And that's okay when we talk about palpitations in their heart. It's okay. Don't worry about one or two skip beats because even the most efficient drummer is going to skip a beat. And so, you know, that's a beautiful analogy. Yeah, that's great. I did some research before you came on, and your specialty is primarily men, so it's a male-dominated specialty. Have you had any challenges or pushback because of this? Great question. Again, as you know, um, you know, 12% of all board-certified cardiologists are women, and if when you look at EP, 6% of them are women. You know, the data is anywhere between 7 to 10%. And I recently wrote an article uh, for EP Lab Digest on this important aspect of why someone should choose EP and how do we attract more women and even men to join mm-hmm. the EP team. Now, going back to your question, um, yes, uh, I personally, now mind you, this is 25 years ago, so I never thought of male and female, you know, um, I didn't. I just went into it because that's what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Um, If you put me in the spot and said, during your fellowship, during your training, did you perceive um, the gender bias? Um, Yes, I can give you anecdotes. um, But I also would stand up and say, I did have the support of the male mentors as well. So if I just said, you know, I was Gender bias really affected me, and I did not have any support from male um, colleagues or the mentors. Uh, I'm not being truthful. Yes, there was gender bias, but the male mentors did help me, um, you know, mold into my own field uh, to do the mm-hmm. best job. Now, yes, the, you need to have, I think, resilience and uh, is done with. I, I don't think we as women in cardiology or EP or surgical fields, we should not talk much about resilience anymore. It has to change at the culture level. The culture has to change. Even the minor comments, uh, microaggressions or comments like that do get under your skin. Well, I'm older now into my profession. How did I deal with it then? Well, I just rubbed it off and I said, you know what, whatever doesn't matter. I'm going to go with my dream. I'm going to do what I need to do. But not everyone who wants to do EP comes with that mindset. And I think as a culture, we need to support them. We need to speak out when we need to. But at the same time, there is a component of he for she. There are men who are supportive um, 
So we should not make a blanket statement that all men, you know, all women. No, it's it's a balance. Yeah, it's all about your outlook on things. You know, if you have a good outlook, nothing can, you know, change that. And when I hear you, I feel like you have two main things that make you super strong and it's being a foreign born physician. So that's already going to make it harder for you here in the U S practicing. And then also you're a female in a male dominated specialty. Um, and you just persevere. You're in a leadership role. So to me, that's incredibly inspiring. Yeah. So no, that's, it's a very good question. And, uh, you know, uh, American College of Cardiology has women in cardiology section, as you know. And I am in the communication, um, council and I'm a member of advocacy council. And, uh, um, I just wrote an article that will be out, um, in June about the 10 tips for survival for women in cardiology. Um, and in that, yes, work life, you know, work and family balance. Um, and other issues, but gender bias is real. It's out there. But by resilience, we can't fix the problem. We just have to change the culture. Um, and having said that, we also have to respect and bring the he on, he for she on board with us. You know, there are so many men who are very supportive and we can't make blanket statements. You had mentioned, uh, the work life balance. How do you handle that? Beautiful question. Now, um, <laughs> I'll be honest with you. So um, <laughs> you're an EP. <laughs> you have to be available all the time. <laughs> so the um, one of you know one of my friends who is in the surgery long time ago, um, she actually said, you know, if I ever sell my profession, saying it's a perfect profession for work uh, family um, balance. Uh, I'm not being truthful, and I agree with her. So I would not say EP is a field that is perfect for work and family balance. Having said that, I wrote an article on this, and, uh, you know, the days you're in the lab, you're very busy. So those are the days. So, for example, I'll touch on two points with regards to that question. One is you can design your own schedule. Once you get to a level there, you say, okay, I'm going to work four days a week and the three days are my family time. And I have negotiated that because those four days don't mean it's eight to five job. They are very long days. Um, They're days where, you know, pretty much on a routine basis, six o'clock, you're out the door and you do not get home before nine o'clock. So, you know, those are long days and then you're on call at night. So, Four days a week or whatever, you know, if you want to do four and a half days, but negotiate that. That's my message to women. Unless you ask, the contracts are not going to be out there for you. People are not going to ask you, what do you want? You need to step up and say, this is what I want. The other side to that is be realistic about your compensation. You cannot work four or four and a half days and expect a full compensation. And so knowing what you want is an important aspect in it. Second thing is design your week. So if I'm in the lab two and a half days a week, then those two days are very long days. I have zero. I tell my husband I'm not going to be home, and he knows. He's an interventional cardiologist, so he knows. He's like, okay, these are the two days I can't take my calls. She's not going to be home. So get help from family, friends nanny, babysitters, those two days are all for patients. Nothing else should distract us from our patients. Now, the clinic days, on the other hand, you know, you can start off early, skip the lunch, and, you know, finish off earlier and plan it. I wish I had a better answer, um, you know, as far as that aspect, but those are the ways I um, deal with my life and my family. No, that's a great answer. All of that, you know, seems like you got a good balance going on. Um, As I was doing research on you, I came across an article stating that you were one of the first people in your region to implant the world's smallest pacemaker. Tell me more about that. (laughs) Yeah, so, um, so I moved recently to Texas, to Dallas from Ohio. So Ohio has always been close to my heart because I trained at Michigan, so... Up there, um, 
you know, <laughs> the nursing staff and uh, my staff and everyone always joked, I like to embrace new things as long as they've been tested out well. And I tell my patients, you know, someone else has tried it for a year or a year and a half. Looks like their patients are doing well. I'll, let's do this. And, uh, you know, with my patients, I usually am the first one to take up any new technology and try it out. And uh, I actually was the first impl- uh, first um, physician to start off the AFib ablation program in that particular healthcare system in Northwest Ohio. And then years down the road, the Micra comes out, and I'm fascinated by new technology and new skills. And, uh, you know, I I sit at the board meeting, and I tell the men, male colleagues, hey, I'm going to go get the training. I want to do this. And they're very supportive. They're like, go right. You know, and then after that, I train the other guys. And, uh, you know, so I love doing procedures, and I love uh, doing new new things as long as they're safe and effective. I love that. That's inspiring and awesome to hear. Let me ask you, Doc, what do you like most and least about your specialty? I, th- I guess I understand what you like most about your specialty. You've been kind of some, saying some glowing comments. What do you like least about being an EP? EP, well, you know, this is maybe it's not going to be a huge issue in the future, but as of now, we're in the transition phase, so the least appealing thing in EP is the radiation exposure and wearing the lead and independent of the radiation exposure and wearing the lead, the third thing that bothers me is the hours that we stand on our feet. Why does it bother me? Because it tells you I'm getting older. Um, Not super old, but getting there. Now, the back, um, if you look at EP physicians, a majority of them um, do have some kind of spine problems, shoulder problems, neck problems because they're standing on their feet for long hours. And radiation, um, brain cancers, uh, bone cancers, skin cancers, as you know, have been looked at interventional physicians. And uh, uh, so they're there. Radiation is not safe. Now, it is slowly transitioning into fluoro-free procedures um, and uh, using the three-dimensional mapping systems rather than using the x-ray guidance, using those mapping systems. In the next five years, I would think that the radiation exposure will be, you know, much less than what I was exposed to. Yeah. And, and then you just hope that... Point. Yes, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, and you just hope that as, you know, the years move on and we progress, that all that gets a little bit safer mm-hmm. for you safer guys. For the, yes, yes. And the second point is... While we embrace the technology, uh, my message to the younger uh, people, whether fellows, residents, whoever want to go into EP, I want our profession to still embrace the human side of it. I'll tell you why I say that, because more and more the field is extremely technical, okay? We talk about voltages, thresholds, um, but then I don't want us to become so engrossed in growing the technology and become expert technicians in the lab, yet lose the communication skills, sitting with the patient, taking time to talk to them. Um, And I recently wrote an article on Kevin MD, um, my dream as a physician, talking about uh, physician burnout with the RVUs and with the healthcare systems, um, you know, different layers of uh, insurance issues and multiple layers, as you're aware. So I think, you know, that burnout, I hope and I wish, does not trickle down to our patients, you know, our patient care. Um, So somehow we have to change the culture. As EP physicians, we should not limit ourselves to expert technicians. We should embrace medicine as a field, uh, keeping the patient in mind, their illness, their stories, there's so much to learn from every patient. Do you find uh, that's changed um, due to the you know technology and everyone's engaged looking at their phones or their communication device and there's less eye contact as far as with your new, let's say, medical students coming through? Is there a lack of being able to connect with patients or not to the same extent when you were training? 100%. And um, 
100%. So two things to that. You know, if you know, if you can see, you know, 10 years ago, I don't ever remember taking a need to take a laptop into the room when I'm seeing a patient because there was no EMR, okay? So, you know, you go sit, talk to the patient, make eye contact, take time to examine them, and then you go write a note. Well, I will tell you, EMR is a wonderful thing. It is a beautiful thing, but it was put forth without much thought laid into it. There's no interface. There's no software interface. So I don't know what this patient has gone through at a different hospital because they have a different EMR. And when they come and see me at this hospital, I have no idea. So I'm wasting my time looking at this electronic records without any software interface. It's stealing my time away from my patients. That's one. Second thing is exactly what you said. People no more communicate, you know, verbally. It's all this one-word text, yes. No, yep. Mm -hmm. While that's making everything efficient, we still need it. But I wish the students in the younger generations not, I hope they don't lose the interview skills, the communication skills, the, you know, examining the patient, listening to the story, because history pretty much is 90% of your diagnosis. You get the diagnosis out of a nice, a thorough history and a physical exam. You know exactly what the patient mm -hmm. is suffering from and what do you as a physician need to do to help them. I have found in, in my experience of talking with docs in all specialties that more and more are requesting scribes so they can have that interconnection with the patient while someone takes the important notes for the EMR where they don't lose that engagement and connection with the patient. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And scribes are so important, um, but supporting, but having, you know, how do you, how do you convince um, someone, you know, to pay for these scribes? <laughs> That's another story. Yeah. <laughs> so those are the roadblocks. Now, I just wanted to um, touch on this. You know, we always talk about, I'm um, actually uh, working on writing an article on this. We always use the word work, you know, life balance. To me, in medicine, if I may use the word, it's absurd. We can't use that. How can a physician's life be independent of a patient's story? I mean, it's integrated. So I'm um, just in the works, um, you know, writing an article where it's more of whether we use work, family balance, and that's okay, or you say work-life integration. You know, you integrate your work into your life because as a physician, you know, I carry stories home and I carry the triumphs, I carry the losses uh, home, and patient stories are part of me. And the reason I chose to go into medicine is not – because I wanted, oh, I, I want a great lifestyle. No, I never thought about it. I went to med into medicine because I really, truly want to do a good job taking care of my patients and yeah. they become part of my life. So I'm curious, as an EP, you're going to have those good days and you're going to have hard days. What are some of the things that you've developed to help when those hard days come home with you? Maybe there's like a routine or activity or something to help you manage that stress. Um, great question again. A few things, um, hobbies, having every position. I teach the young, uh, you know, when I mentor people through the ACC member hub or I have uh, pre-med students, I've mentored numerous uh, over the years. I tell them you have to have a hobby. You have to have an interest outside medicine. Otherwise, the burnout will get to you. So what do I do? I basically, I write poetry, so I love writing poems, and I read a lot of books, um, and I love history, world history, American history, any history, I just love it, and I could just, that relaxes me. And then I go exercise, so making time to work out. Um, for me, swimming is my, you know, zen zone, where I kind of in the water I'm myself, I don't think of anything else. And, uh, you know, any hobby, I mean, I do art. I draw um, pictures, not a great artist by any means, but, 
you know, I just draw. And then family time, bonding uh, with the family, um, taking time. And uh, children, believe it or not, um, doesn't matter how old they are, they bring out this innocence to life. You know, life is so complicated out there. And you come home, you listen to your child tell you something silly from school and you're like, oh my God, that is so funny, you know. And so, you know, bonding uh, with the own, you know, your own family. Last thing for that is network, um, positions to positions. If I want to vent, it's a tough day, you need to go, you need to have your best friends in the same field where you can vent and say, you know what, this was just whatever. But if I try to talk to, for example, my sibling, my sister, who is a professor in artificial intelligence, she won't understand what I'm trying to tell her, even though she's my best friend. So I have a couple of really best friends in medicine where I we kind of talk and, you know, yes. unload. Mm -hmm. As a, an electrophysiologist, how frequently are you using, let's say, social media through these different, you know, groups online that, hey, I got this difficult case to kind of bounce off ideas? Now, I am active on Twitter. I, I, I was a skeptic as far as social media goes. And then last year, um, the women in cardiology section chair, um, I was talking to her and she said, you need to get on Twitter. I mean, you have ideas, and uh, so I joined Twitter last year, and uh, I mostly go on the social media to talk about, because I have various other interests, you know, burnout is one thing, advocacy, culture change, women empowerment, these, apart from EP, I have many interests, so, you know, I kind of have varying uh, Twitter buddies, Twitter friends, so I kind of interact. Now, when it comes to sharing a difficult case, um, I don't think I use Twitter or any social media for that matter. I just, I'm very careful because HIPAA and uh, somehow or the other, if that information gets back to the patient or it's just, you know, it's a private matter. And um, how do I get help when there's a difficult case? I pick up my phone and I call my mentors um, at Ann Arbor or one of my colleagues here um, or in Ohio and, hey, say, hey, what do you think, you know? And so I, I get very good input from them. I don't use uh, social media much for, you know, to share difficult cases. I'm just afraid of um, HIPAA, old school, yeah. I guess. And, and it sounds like, you know, as you're responding, I was thinking, you know, we a lot of times receive uh, texts and emails and there's a lot that's missing in just a word communication is your your tone and the, your, the context of your voice and what you're saying sometimes is an important piece of information like if you're talking with a, a mentor or a, you know a fellow attending mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I agree you know rather than um, you know while Twitter and social media nothing against them like I said um, you don't convey the whole story I mean you can put a story there um, but it's different when I pick up a phone and say this is, you know, so and so your old gentleman or female came in with this, and you know, I have more story there, mm -hmm. um, which gives a good perspective to the overall case um, in mm -hmm. the lab, rather than just post it on Twitter. And mind you, sometimes I have people comment, and um, whether it's negative or positive, those comments, if they're especially negative, um, I it just Overall, I just, you know, it just doesn't bring, bring anything constructive out of it. Yeah. You know, the dialogue needs to be for the growth of the field or benefit of the patient. And everyone has mentors. Everyone has colleagues. I don't know if Twitter is the way to do it or yeah. whatever social media. Yeah, that reminds me. Chris and I just recently spoke with a hematology oncology fellow, and he uses social media to preach good information because the internet is so convoluted and people just use Dr. Google and they find the first thing that comes up. So as a physician, if he can make himself available to give good, accurate information, that's how he feels good using the social media platform, you know, to benefit the general public. Yes. And that's more of an informational and that's wonderful. 
Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, you're not tagging that information to any specific patient, you know. I mean, I'm all about with the new group I joined here. It's uh, one of the, it is the largest EP group, Texas Cardiac Arrhythmia. Um, Andrea and Natale and, you know, big leaders in EP. I joined them and I'm the first female in the group. And they're wonderful guys, great guys. Um, so, you know, groups like that, if we make a, I, I want to work with them and see if we can design a website with that same intention. Not so much as patient problems, but you know, take a topic, educate the general public out there. For example, atrial fibrillation. What are the types of atrial fibrillation? What kind of help, you know, you can get and resources and what does it mean to a given patient? So more of an educational Mm -hmm. platform. Yeah, that's a great implementation. As a electrophysiologist, what are some of the most common cases that you're seeing these days relevant to your field? Majority of the volume falls into, you know, as you know, we do two groups. One is ablations and the other are the devices. Amongst the ablations, the number one cause for ablation is, uh, you know, the commonest cases are atrial fibrillation, the commonest arrhythmia across the board. And the AFib incidence and the prevalence is much higher because of multiple risk factors, you know, obesity trends diabetes, hypertension, um, coronary artery disease, sleep apnea. So AFib is our commonest ablation case. And um, amongst the devices, mm, defibrillators and pacemakers. Mm. And the newer technology, you know, my passion and my interest is to slowly sway away from le- device devices with leads. So the leadless technology, like the Micra, the one you talked about, um, the leadless pacemaker, we also mm-hmm. have a subcutaneous defibrillator. So this is a defibrillator we put under the skin. It's all subcutaneous. The lead goes under the skin next to the sternum. A single lead, everything is in the subcutaneous tissue. No lead goes to the vascular system. And that's a fascinating um, you know, growth in EP. So we see a lot of pacemakers and defibrillators with the growth in sub-QICDs or subcutaneous defibrillators. Yeah, interesting. A big chunk of our listeners are med students. What advice would you give them when they're getting ready to choose a specialty? Now, for medical students, you know, it's a three-pronged approach. One, I tell them, okay, you need to make a short-term goal, a goal for yourself. Short-term, what do I do? You know. And then a long-term vision. So that's leg one, and I'll elaborate on that. Second one is in your own, you know, life. So I use a term when I give, um, you know, lectures as a mentor, as a motivational speaker. Uh, when I talk to, you know, at women empowerment events, I tell people, customize life to unique you. So you need to customize your own life to yourself. You don't compare yourself to someone else. That's the second one. And the third one is, where is your skill set and passion? Okay. Now, number one, um, short term, you know, look at yourself. Okay, in the next two years, this is what I want to learn. And But the long-term vision, by this age, I want to get married, have kids, whatever, you know, people are, settle down in this town, do this, do that. So, have those goals written down on a paper because they will play a role in the ultimate decision. Second, customizing life is a very important component. It again goes back to that burnout. You see so many people saying, oh, he or she is able to do that. Why am I not able to do it? Or that self-doubt, thinking, am I not inadequacy? You know, you feel your inadequate self-doubt. That, uh, you know, adds up to that burnout. So customizing that life. So if you're already dating someone, you know, plan out the life with them. Okay, so when do we want to get married? When do we want to have kids? And what do you want to do? What's your, you know, how do we do this? Are we choosing a bigger city to live in, smaller city? And a private practice, academia. Do you want to go into research or do um, clinical research alone with some teaching? So those are the layers that they need to write down on a paper as a couple or as an individual. Now the, you know, and of course the third one is 
it's innate in them. They need to know what their passion and their skill set. You know, passion alone, but then sometimes you have a dream, but that, you know, "Eh, I don't know if I have the skills for it. Skill is something you can grow into it or a skill, something, you know, someone is born with. Um, You can always hone into your skills, but someone knows for sure, yes, I'm good at doing procedures, then go into a procedure field. Someone says, no, I'm not, I don't want to do procedures. My skill is, you know, dealing with someone with cancer, you know, how I, I know I have empathy, end of life issues. Yes, I can go into hospice, you know, medicine, stuff like that. So putting that on a paper, talking to their partners, our spouses, and if needed, with their family and laid out, but being confident in the de- decision and letting nothing stop them. They can do it. No fear. You know, just go for your goals. What great advice and a good way to end the podcast. Um, I can't believe we're already out of time, but I wanted to thank you so much for spending the morning with us and chatting. Um, And I just find you so inspiring. And the one thing I do love is that your attitude and your outlook on what you do. It's just so important to have that type of mindset. Yes, absolutely. The positive attitude. And that's a beautiful way to end this. And I truly appreciate your time. And I hope you guys have a wonderful day. Thank you. You as well. Yeah. And I got to tell you, Doc, as you were given some goals and the question that Summer asked, I wrote down, uh, as soon as it's done, I'm going to send this. I have two daughters that are 16 and 23. And I thought some of the comments and remarks you made, um, I'm getting a little tear in my eye. I was like, this is very inspirational for a, a professional woman to pass on her ideas to, you know, I got two daughters that are early in their careers, uh, one still in high school, but to get that kind of focus from someone out there that says, hey, I've been there, you know, I'm a couple years older than you, but this is what you need to do. It Sometimes it means more not coming from a parent. <laughs> oh, 100%. <laughs> Absolutely. So thank you. Yep. Yep. Bye. Bye, guys. Thanks again. Thank you to all our listeners. If you'd like to be notified when new episodes air, make sure to hit that subscribe button. And thank you to Pacific Companies. Without you guys, this podcast would not be possible. If you'd like to be a guest or for more information, go to www.pacificcompanies.com.